There's a lot of confusion in our world about what it means to be human, but the Bible speaks to this. And, and as we're going to look today, we're going to talk about the image of God in Scripture. And we're joined by, I guess, Dr. Grace Sutanta, who's working on this question in depth. So welcome to Clarity and Brevity. Today I'm joined again by Gray Sutanto, who is studying the image of God and may be able to help us think through what the Bible teaches about it. So Gray, welcome to the channel. Thanks, Brandon, for having me. So the Bible talks about people are made in the image of God. Can you explain where does that come from and what does that mean? Yeah, the language of us being made in the image of God is found in Genesis 1, 26, 28, where it says that God made us in his own image. And so um, it talks about um, us being called to be fruitful, to multiply. Psalm 8 also talks about this, where we are made a little bit lower than the angels, and yet we are given dominion over everything around us that's not human. And so we are called to be representatives on earth. We're called to be representing God. We're called to be in relationship with God. We're intrinsically religious creatures. Our meaning is not founded in ourselves, but in something outside of us, namely in God. And so as we reflect God, as we represent God, we're able to represent that kingly and prophetic and priestly ministry towards um, the rest of the creation around us as well. So, I mean, that's a, that's a nutshell um, sort of description. We can definitely go deeper in e each one of those aspects. Uh, maybe can you place that in the context of Christian theology and how that's made a difference in theological uh, um, coherence of, of the world and so forth? Yeah, um, within the context of Christian theology, it means that that humanity is indeed the pinnacle of God's created order. I and mean, we see this in God pausing in the creation of humanity and actually breaking into poetic declarations, right? Um, and, and suddenly it's telling us that we are not just good, that we are made very good because we're made in his image. And it also explains why it is that we have responsibilities here on earth so that our dominion over the earth, for instance, is not a lordly sort of dominion that is independent of God, but it's meant to be reflective of God. So I, I prefer to talk about the dominion mandate given in Genesis 128 to be fruitful, to multiply as a cultivation mandate or a cultural mandate, as some other theologians would have called it, right? Where we human beings are imitators of God in our creative activity, for instance. God makes out of nothing, but we make out of the pre-existing material that God had made. God makes ex nihilo, we make out of the nature that God makes, for instance, right? And so as human beings, as we are creators in our own right, um, analogously reflecting God, we will, in fact, represent God's lordship over creation. Um, I mean, there's exegetical material there, too, which talk about how in the ancient Near East, um, the gods of the ancient Near East would have their idols made, um, and they're put in these temples to represent their lordship over that area, for instance. Um, but God doesn't have an idol. God forbids us to form idols of himself. Why? Because the representatives on earth are not these carved images or stones and statues, but rather they're us ourselves. So Bobbing actually connects that language of um, the second commandment of not making carved images of God's self precisely in this idea of the image of God. And, and part of what that entails is the dignity of humanity. You alluded to it uh, over yeah. the rest of creation. Uh, That's right. Can you, can you tease out maybe some of the, the further implications of the dignity of humanity uh, in the context of creation? Yeah, the dignity of humanity is, is crucially an implication of the image of God, such that it is wrong, for instance, for us to murder a man. So Genesis 9, 6 talks about that. It is wrong for us to curse our fellow human being who are made in the image of God. Uh, James 3 talks about that, how our tongues, with the same tongues, we bless God, and yet at the same time, we curse our fellow human beings. If we're made in the image of God, um, it would be not only sinful, but it would be um, um, an offense against God himself to wrong our fellow human beings, right? And so um, with dignity comes certain implications and certain presuppositions as well. As human beings made in the image of God, we have intellectual faculties who are able to think in conscious ways. We're able to reason in particular ways that is unique to ourselves. And so we are rational animals. And at the same time, we're related to one another, ethically speaking. There's an ethical bond between us. You know, it's kind of a cliche example now, but when a lion kills its prey, we don't call it that murder. But if we kill our fellow human being, we do indeed call that mur murder. There is a moral culpability to our actions precisely because we're made to be in relationship with one another. 
And and Bobby really teases out really well where where that ethical relation that we have with one another is seen most clearly in the covenant solidarity that we have with Adam or Christ. Why is it that Adam's federal representative of us that when he sinned, we sinned, um, is is fitting? Well, it's because we are made to be ethically connected. We're not autonomous human beings. We're not purely individual creatures. That's a myth of Western Lyman philosophy, but rather what we do impact impacts one another. The federal representative of Adam and Christ is the greatest witness to that. And also we see that in analogous ways, in the ways in which the fathers or mothers represent the family, where one member of the family really impacts the whole. A king might impact the whole nation through his actions, or a president in our context would impact the whole nation, for instance. So we see all those thick, ethical, relational obligations that we have with one another because we're made in the image of God. Well, you mentioned Herman Bovink a couple of times. Yeah. Is there anything that maybe you've addressed it, but something, anything that Reformed theology distinctively brings out in this discussion of the image of God? Yeah, so I'm writing a book right now on theological anthropology, and if you take a look at the contemporary theological landscape on what it means to be made in the image of God, they, they typically divide it up into three models or three ways of talking about it. First is the so-called structural model, where it says that we're made in the image of God in the sense that we have a particular metaphysical structure, that we're rational animals, we've got a particular intellectual soul, an embodied soul, whatever else we want to say about it, whether you're a substance dualist or the so-called holomorphous theory where the soul is the form of the body or the soul is very separate from the body, which is the substance dualist view. That's the structural model. We're made in the image of God because of the makeup of who we are ontologically or in terms of our being. The second aspect of the image of God or second model is what's called the vocational model of the image of God. We've already alluded to this where we're made in the image of God because we are the ones who are given a particular vocation. It's not the animals that were given a vocation. It's not the trees. It's not even the angels, but we were given a vocation to be fruitful and to multiply. And as a result of that multiplication, representatives of God will go forth in the earth, creating culture, and will represent God's name. And the Psalm 8 talks about this as human beings go forth, the glory of God goes forth in all the earth as well. Um, the, the third aspect is the relational model, that we are in some way um, imaging the Trinity in our relationships or imaging Christ in our relationship with him, for instance. And what we see in the Reformed tradition it's a refusal to isolate any of these aspects from one another. When you take a look at Francis Tiriton, when you take a look at Peter van Maastricht, and finally Bavin, who depends on these authors alongside others in the Reformed tradition, they would argue that the image of God, yes, might principally mean our metaphysical makeup, who we are as an embodied soul, for instance, but um, precisely because we're made in the image of God, we do have dominion responsibilities because we are the only ones with the capacities to do those things. And we have a relationship with God and we have an obligation to maintain that relationship with God, such that if we disobeyed God and his word, we would always misunderstand our place in the world, for instance. So you actually see them sort of just codifying different aspects of the image of God and different entailments of the image of God without feeling the need to just isolate one of those models from one another. So I think it, it's worth uh, emphasizing that our tradition is much richer than I think some contemporary discussions of the image of God on this. Well, and this sounds perhaps it's practical, but it might sound a little bit theoretical to those who are watching. Could you maybe draw out some of the practical implications for issues facing our culture, uh, issues that questions that people might have that maybe there's confusion about even and what does the Bible teach? Uh, how does the image of God relate to some of these important questions? Yeah, so many different ways, right? Our culture today is incredibly conflicted. On the one hand, we're told that we are meaningless creatures, meaningless things, even atoms reducible to the dust. And there's nothing significant about us. And there's nothing that makes us different from the table in front of me because we're all made of the same material stuff. And yet at the same time, our culture tells us that we have to create our own meaning. We have certain responsibilities. And the moment we violate those responsibilities, we can get canceled or you know, they demand justice to be done for this or that life, right? So it's very conflicted on this. Are we meaningless? Are we so full of meaning that we have all these responsibilities? Well, the image of God, notice, you know, to use Chris Watkins' term, diagonalizes between these two polar opposites. We are dust, and so we are humble and dependent, and our meaning is not defined by ourselves, but rather it's defined by God. And yet, because we're made in the image of God, we do have inherent dignity. We do have meaning. And so we, we find no longer this oscillation, this going back and forth between meaninglessness on the one hand and this um, 
this almost deifying responsibility to make a meaning for ourselves, to create meaning for ourselves. And that's what modern culture continues to tell us. I think the second thing that we could say about the image of God is that there is objectivity to who we are. What we are and what we do matters to God. Um, our bodies are not something that is secondary to us. We're not souls in a prison house of the body. The body is not a mere instrument to our own autonomous will. Our bodies is part of our identity. And so there's an authority to the body. We see this, for instance, in the ways in which we need to eat and sleep. If we don't listen to our body, we will literally die. Uh, our bodies, therefore, have a kind of pressure on us, again, an authoritative pressure. And so we better listen to it. And so who we are as male and female is mentioned in Genesis 1, 26, 27, right? And that is very much involved in, in the call to be fruitful and to multiply and, and to procreation. And so our bodies have functions that are not arbitrary, and they are functions that we, we need to recognize rather than actually create. Um, the third thing uh, we would say about the creation in the image of God is, is that because we're made in the image of God, we're intrinsically religious, in the decline of Christianity in the West here, and people comment on this all the time, what we're going to see and where we're, what we're already seeing is not the demise of religion per se, but the substitution of Christianity with some other religion. I was just talking with my friend, um, Corey Brock, who's a pastor in Edinburgh, and he's talking how because Christianity is on the decline there, there is an uptick in occultism, in spiritual witchcraft, and all kinds of divinization practices. Why? Because when we take away the explicit belief in the Christian God, our sense of the divine, our sense of who, who we are as image bearers will still emerge in other ways. If we don't worship God, we're going to worship something else. We're worshiping creatures. We're made in the image of the divine after all. And so it's not surprising that with the demise of Christianity, you don't see a, a lowering of religious faith, but you see still the stability of religious faith in other forms. And if those other forms are not going to be as as... Well, they're not revealed religions, first of all, but of course they're not going to be as stable as I think what we have in the Christian faith. Well, Greg, this is really helpful. Uh, are there any resources? I know you're working on a book. Any resources you could uh, recommend to somebody who might want to learn more about what the Bible teaches about the image of God? Yeah, I would I would point people to the couple of chapters in Bobbing's Wonderful Works of God and the Image of God. That's a great little starting point. In terms of more contemporary literature, um, Joshua Ryan Ferris has a great little introduction. Not little, it's 300 pages, but it has got a good introduction to general theological anthropology. I'd also refer people to Christopher Watkins' book, Biblical Critical Theory, especially the earlier chapters where he covers the image of God there, because uh, he really teases out the implications of this Christian model of the, Christ of, the, of the image of God for us in contemporary culture, especially. Thank you, Gray. I'll, I'll leave some links to those books. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing your expertise on this topic. It's very informative. So I hope this has been helpful. Thanks for watching. Remember to keep it clear and focus on Christ.